Well, hi everyone. I wanna get back to a space-related video today, and I really hadn't paid much attention to this mission until recently, and I'm fascinated. I think this is probably one of the most exciting space missions uh, ever undertaken by anybody, let alone NASA. So we'll go through the details. Uh, there's plenty to look forward to, so I'm excited to bring this to you today, so let's get started. So what we're talking about is Europa Clipper. It's a robotic probe that's going to go to Jupiter and it's going to have several flybys of one of Jupiter's uh, main moons, if you want to call it that. Uh, over 49 flybys are planned. They've loaded this probe with nine scientific instruments, which include two high resolution cameras. So I'm going to go through exactly what these instruments are. I mean, it's, it's pure geophysics and it's really exciting, but these are very specially designed instruments, uh, years to come up with the concepts, uh, design and construction, and it's gonna take several more years for this probe to reach Europa. So I wanna go through what's involved, what are the key aspects of this mission and why it's so exciting. So the key fact is one of Jupiter's four largest moons. It has an ice shell that's estimated to have a thickness of 10 to 15 miles. It's significantly brighter than our moon. And they think there's a liquid ocean underneath this ice cap that's 50 miles thick. And so the volume of water would be twice that of all the Earth's oceans. And Europa orbits Jupiter every three and a half days. So of course, these are one of the four so-called Galilean satellites or moons of Jupiter. He discovered it with the other three moons in 1610 when he first got his telescope that he had made in operation. In the 1960s, ground-based telescope observations determined that Europa's surface composition is mostly water ice, as are most other solid bodies of the outer solar system. So Europa Clipper launched atop of a Falcon Heavy rocket on October 14, 2024 from Kennedy Space Center. Planning for this mission started many, many years ago, at least as far back as 2013. Construction of the probe began at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena in 2019, and it's got about five years travel time to get to Jupiter. Jupiter has a total of 95 moons, and the distance from Earth to Europa is 1.8 billion miles. So to transmit a signal from Earth to the Europa probe takes 45 minutes, and then obviously it takes 45 minutes from a signal from the probe to reach Earth. So there's a lot of robotics, a lot of software to control the operation of this probe once a command's been sent. The main purpose of this mission is to determine whether Europa has the conditions necessary to support life. It's not looking for life per se, but it's looking for the precursor conditions, which is very important. You know, most of the unmanned space missions have been almost obsessively focused on Mars. And I can understand that from a sort of romantic standpoint. Uh, you know, Mars is very much like Earth, except it's, uh, it's a lot drier, obviously. But at one time, Mars had surface water, and some people think that life may have actually started on Mars, but there's, there's really no evidence for that right now. And they've spent a lot of time collecting samples with these rovers on Mars' surface, and they're just sitting there or they're waiting for a return mission. So it's possible that the discovery is yet to be made of existence of past life on Mars. But in terms of a prospect for life on another body in the solar system outside of Earth, you have these most likely candidates with the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. And uh, talk about Enceladus with Saturn and Europa here with Jupiter. So this is some more details with the timeline. So it has to take a roundabout way to get to Europa. And that's because it doesn't have enough fuel on board to basically just power straight to Europa. The public doesn't seem to be keen on nuclear propulsion for these probes that are launched uh, from the Earth. Although I think that needs to change. Uh, hopefully it will change. So these probes as they're configured now to be able to carry enough fuel and satisfy their mission requirements have to get orbital assists along the way. So it's going to get an assist from uh, the Earth as well as Mars. And the first flyby of the other moons nearby 
will be in the fall of 2030, and the first expected flyby of Europa is the spring of 2031. So it's just a rendering of what this could look like. Now, I mentioned why Europa is such an exciting target for these science missions. It's a very active environment. Even though the surface temperature is typically 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, it's very active. There's evidence of these geysers, water jets being shot out through the cracks on this ice shell. They believe that there are thermal fissures in the bedrock underlying this ocean on the seafloor. And as we know, such thermal vents on Earth support a variety of microscopic life uh, under tremendously high temperatures and pressures. Now let's just take a look at this launch that occurred aboard a Falcon Heavy, because I, I think it's really impressive. You know, originally this launch was to occur on the SLS system, which is not fully operational, and I think it may end up getting canceled. In the meantime, SpaceX has stepped up and is now handling these launches for NASA. The interesting thing with SpaceX's involvement is they redid the system for loading cryogenic propellants onto the Falcon Heavy. And these missions, these planetary missions, have very specific windows in order to capitalize on these orbital assists. So if the planets get out of position from where you need them to be by the time you launch, it could be years before you could do that again. So if you have to scrub a mission, the previous reset time was five days, and then SpaceX got it down to two days, which is really supporting these missions. It's, it's a great innovation, in my opinion, and it hasn't really been discussed too much, to my knowledge. But let's look at, here's the ascent timeline, and you can see it takes about an hour after launch before the probe separates from the Falcon Heavy. Europa Clipper, separation confirmed. And there you go. NASA's Europa Clipper probe embarking on a long-awaited mission to study Jupiter's icy moon Europa. And what a sight, Mick. That is absolutely gorgeous, Gerald, to see Europa Clipper on its way. Successful deployment from stage two. Falcon Heavy performed very well today. Could you imagine how nerve-wracking that would be for people who have spent most of their careers at these uh, NASA facilities making this mission a reality. I mean, I, I just can't even imagine the, the pressure that they're, they're under to see this launch uh, to be successful. And of course, then it's like a, a kid waiting uh, for Christmas for the data to start coming back, which is still years away. It's gonna be very, very interesting in terms of the discoveries that uh, are likely to be made here with this mission. It appears that the geology on Europa is active. If you compare impact craters on the moon, which are, have been preserved for millions of years, Europa is this pretty fresh surface overall. So it suggests perhaps that this ice shell is cracked throughout and that these plates, if you will, move relative to each other, much, much like uh, the Earth's plates, uh, tectonic plates that produce earthquakes, in some cases, they have subduction zones or spreading zones. It's quite an active environment. All right, so as I mentioned, there are a total of nine science instruments. You have thermal imaging system, ultraviolet spectrograph. You've got various other spectrometers, magnetometers, plasma detectors. The radar, I think, is the most interesting thing to me, and I'll go more in detail on that. And then you have uh, other instruments, that, including one that is going to collect surface dust that may be ejected from the surface of Europa. And it, on these flybys, the collector will grab these samples and analyze them. So this graphic gives you an idea of just how big this probe is. With the solar arrays unfurled, the overall length of the probe is over 100 feet, which is greater than that of a standard basketball court. One of the reasons I'm really excited about this radar unit is I recently did a video about Camp Sentry in Greenland, and there was a story a few months back about how NASA had been collecting radar data of the Greenland ice cap, and then they realized they had inadvertently discovered the remnants of an old military installation that's about 100 feet under the ice that was constructed in the late 50s, early 60s. 
And in that video, I incorrectly stated I didn't see how radar could penetrate the ice. Well, they can design the radar array to do exactly that, to penetrate the ice. So the radar unit on Europa Clipper is designed to penetrate the full thickness of the ice cap, which they think could be 10 to 15 miles thick. Here's some specs on that radar unit. This is an overall cross-section of Europa. They believe it has a metallic core. There's bedrock, a liquid ocean, and the ice crust. So let's look at some of these images. Reason, that's the radar array. Gravitometers, magnetometers, plasma detectors. Really sophisticated probe for sure. So things really got more interesting regarding Europa with the Galileo probe flyby on September 7th, 1996. You see all this cracking, all this coloration. That little segment that I played referenced the intense magnetic field around Jupiter. It's, uh, I believe, one of the more intense in the solar system. And that's why Europa is designed to have periodic flybys and not continuously orbit closely to Europa because it would get fried. You know, if you put enough shielding uh, on a spacecraft to withstand that environment, it would be impractical uh, from an overall mission standpoint. So just another graphic of these plumes. They think that uh, the intense radiation on Europa's surface could produce perchlorites and other compounds that are subducted into the liquid ocean. Subducted, that is, part of uh, one ice segment plunges under the edge of another. And the reason for these plumes is the intense gravitational pull of Jupiter. And the tides acting on this ice crust can produce as much as 100 feet of deformation. So you can think of a tide on Earth that's maybe 10 or 15 feet high. Imagine an ice surface bulging and returning or relaxing over a distance of 100 feet. And of course, since uh, Europa has such a relatively fast orbit around Jupiter, this is a really uh, frequent squeezing and relaxing, squeezing and relaxing situation. So a lot of energy going into the, the uh, sorry to say, planetary system, the, the satellite, the Europa here. In 2027, NASA is going to launch the Europa lander so it'll continue with sampling and doing other investigations uh, on the surface of Europa. So I'll do a separate video about this probe later on, but just a lot of exciting stuff coming up here. So again, the objective of this Europa lander is to characterize the composition of non-ice near subsurface material and determine the depth to liquid water and recently erupted material near the lander's location. So there's been past missions near Europa. Uh, Voyager 1 made a close approach in March of 1979. And of course, I mentioned the Galileo mission in the 90s. We, were, we got a lot more information about Europa and the other satellites of Jupiter. So I can't wait for the data to start coming back on this mission. A video here showing them working on the probe at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That large dish is the high gain antenna for sending data to Earth that's collected from the science instruments. So as with all NASA missions, this was a collaborative effort from various facilities throughout the United States. The two main labs were the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena and the Applied Physics Laboratory in Baltimore. And I thought I'd mention this book. It's called The Mission by David Brown. It gets into the weeds, as it were, in terms of what it takes to bring a mission like this to fruition. And uh, I'm not making a general recommendation for this book because I think it's just a little too inside baseball, but I think there'll be some of you out there who, who would be interested in it, particularly if you work at a NASA facility or you just want to know more about the individuals that were involved with this mission. I mean, it's, it's very a personalized account of uh, various scientists and engineers who made this all happen. So I'll put a link in the description if you want to check this book out. So again, I'll continue to follow this story, but it'll be some time here before we have a lot more information. But I'll follow up with other space-related content here as we go forward. With that, I'd like to send a shout out to those of you who have contributed to Buy Me a Coffee. That's a great way to support the channel. And of course, I want to thank those of you who have been channel members. 
Uh, many of you have been channel members for over a year now, which I really appreciate. And uh, of course, those of you who provide the super thanks, that's another great way to support the channel. We've got a lot of interesting content coming up, so please stay tuned for future videos.